Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to our event today. Um, the ISP at Yale Law is, and the Groomer um, Film 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 so Janet Brown is the Executive Director of the Commission on Presidential Debates in Washington, D.C., which is a nonprofit organization and is not a wing of the government, which is an important thing that I wanted to note. Um, she's held this position since 1987. Um, before joining the CPD, uh, Ms. Brown served uh, in appointed positions at the White House and the Office of Management and Budget. She also served on the staffs of the Honorable John C. Danforth in the U.S. Senate and the Ambassador Elliot Richardson at this Department of State. Um, the Department, um, so the Commission on Presidential Debates um, was established in 1987 to ensure the benefit of the American electorate that the general ele election debates between uh, leading candidates um, are a permanent part of the electoral process. And to meet its goal of educating voters, the CPD is engaged in various activities beyond producing and sponsoring presidential debates. Um, they also provide technical assistance to emerging democracies and others interested in establishing debate traditions in other countries. Um, Bellavis Bencreta is the founder of the Munathara uh, Institute, or initiative, uh, which is the Arab world's largest debate organization. Um, he was named a 2016 Yale World Fellow and received the 2013 NDI Democracy Award. He's currently a fellow, um, a Cooper Fellow in Global Justice at Yale Law School and a visiting fellow at ISP. And he recently hosted seven debates in Tunisia, um, including the presidential debates. Um, so I'd like to welcome you to this uh, conversation uh, with Janet and others. told I'm going to start, so I'm starting. Can everyone see and hear? Leah, would you like me to move this, or is it movable, the screen? Maybe we can put it, is it better? Good. Thank you. Perfect. Um, a good afternoon, and thank you all for this opportunity, which I realize you had no vote in, but uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here, and I hope we can have this largely a conversation back and forth. Uh, I was asked to give you just a little bit of an overview on what the Commission is and is not. Uh, as Leah mentioned, we are a uh, not-for-profit corporation based in Washington, D.C. You are looking at half the staff, so the other half is in charge of the office right now. Uh, we were started in 1987 uh, after two formal studies, one at the Institute of Politics at Harvard and one at the Center for Strategic and International Studies at Georgetown that took a look at a, a variety of different general election issues and came to the conclusion that given how important debates were in the general election that there should be an organization that was in charge of sponsoring the debates that did nothing else in the general election. Uh, we do not poll, we do not represent the positions of the candidates, we don't get involved in any other aspect of the general election. The Federal Election Commission has two requirements of general debate, spon general election debate sponsors. One is that they be either media organizations or nonprofits, which is what we are. In either event, they must have objective, pre-published criteria that determine who will be included in the debates and how those invitations will be issued. So we are a not-for-profit. We are a 501c3 under IRS regulations. We raise all of our money privately. We do not get any money from the federal government or from political parties or tax. We have been um, sponsoring the general election debates in this country since 1987. Uh, so this will be our ninth cycle that we are well underway with the plans for. We announced the sites and dates two weeks ago. Uh, and the uh, debates generally are held from the end of September through the middle of October, which is what would be the case in 2020. We have held all but three of our debates on college and university campuses, and the reason is simple. These debates are about education, so if you can have them on campuses and get hundreds and hundreds of students and members of the community involved in their production, 
uh, we see that as a as a really good thing. So uh, basically, we have a very narrow charter. We are we are the sponsors and producers of the general election debates. That means we are the sponsors under the FEC rules, and it means we are the production company that comes together every four years to actually put the debates on. When you turn them on and you look at the debate set and the debate hall, everything that is going on in that space is our responsibility with the exception of the cameras and the people operating the cameras and the truck, the production truck, which is outside with a director in it. Those all belong to the television network member of the White House pool, which is charged with covering the debate and actually broadcasting it. I don't know how many of you have had any kind of personal experience with the White House pool, but it is, um, it has, it is a uh, mechanism that's been in place for a very long time that pertains to big events like the debates or the conventions or states of the union where it's completely impractical to have representation from all the different television networks in terms of cameras and sound systems to cover a, an event in a very small space. So the cameras actually uh, and the broadcast itself are there representing a member of the White House pool who draw for coverage of the debates as they do for coverage of the conventions. The debates are 90 minutes long. They are free of any kind of break, commercial or otherwise. They are moderated by journalists that are chosen by the commission for their familiarity with the candidates and their positions, their experience in live hard news television, and for their ability to remember that for better or worse, they are not on the ballot. They are there to facilitate a conversation with the candidates. Since 1992, we have gotten away from the traditional panel of moderator and questioners that existed before we came into the general debate sponsorship. That is what you see in most of the primary debates. Uh, in our case, there is a single moderator who is in charge of the entire 90 minutes. We see that as a way to facilitate focusing the time and attention on the candidates and to making sure that the moderator, in fact, can determine a better flow of the topics and the questions. In the last two cycles, we've tried something, again, that is designed to get more information from the candidates, less interference by anybody else. The first and final presidential debates are divided into six 15-minute pods that each start with a question by the moderator and the balance of the time after each candidate responds is devoted to a back and forth on that issue. The topics are actually uh, chosen and announced by the moderators about 10 days before those debates so that they are known. They can be on foreign or domestic issues, uh, but what that does is to allow for the focus of the time to be on the candidates and their views. Town meeting, as you know, is a completely different format. That is where undecided or uncommitted voters are asked to come in and ask the questions directly of the candidates. In both cases, the questions are known only to the moderator or, in the case of the town meeting, to the questioners. We don't know the questions, nor do the candidates. There, there is no sharing of those, no committee working on those. That is entirely up to the moderators. Moderators are not paid. They are chosen for their experience. They are there representing the American people. They are not there as representatives of their network or their news organization. As you may recall from watching these, there is absolutely no insignia on the set. There is no branding, and there is, there is no kind of marketing of these, which thankfully are carried in real time by all the members of the White House pool, along with anyone else who chooses to take the feed, uh, which includes a very large number of international networks that show this in real time. To give you a, an example of the kinds of audience that you get for a general election debate, uh, a, the first debate in 2016 
uh, the domestic audience was uh, around 80 million people. By the time you add online and international, uh, we conservatively estimate it was about 120 million, million people, which, as you know, is uh, just an enormously larger number than for any other kind of political programming and, in fact, is larger than World Cup or the Olympics or the Super Bowl. Uh, so these are um, very large events that take place in real time. I think we all forget how much of what we see on television has been taped and, and edited. And of course, there are frequent breaks so that people can regroup or rethink what they, what they wanted to ask or what someone may have answered. This is, this is an entirely different, um, different kind of forum. Um, there will be three presidential, one vice presidential debates in 2020, which is what we have had almost consistently uh, since we started. Um, and the work on these, uh, which surprises most people, um, starts uh, about two and a half years before, before the debate. So we are, we are well into that process. Uh, we started working at least a year ago with the networks, before that with federal law enforcement. Cybersecurity is now something that never, never rests. Uh, and uh, what we want to do is make sure that these not only take place in a way that the American public finds helpful, and that the format continues to evolve so that we take advantage of whatever new ideas uh, will, in fact, uh, make them a better use of, of 90 minutes times four, uh, and that they involve the community in such a way that is uh, that goes past four individual nights. Um, it is obvious to everybody in this country we are out of the habit of of civil discourse and of listening. And we hope very much next year we will be also launching a project that tries to get uh, people, particularly young people, first time voters, uh, to come together around the debates and understand that these should be accessible, they should be understandable, they involve issues that will affect all the other races that you might be looking at when you go to vote, and that this should be an opportunity to really understand the issues, and equally importantly, to understand the opinions of the other people that are in your community that may come at something from a different perspective than, than you do. So that is, a, that is a snapshot of the CPD. Uh, when we get going here, I know we're going to cover, and we wouldn't know each other without the international work that, that we do, which came as a total surprise to the commission when it started up back in 1989. Um, we have been approached by groups in other countries, largely NGOs, uh, for assistance with putting on their own debates, starting their own debates, or making them better uh, now since, since 1989, 1990. And it is nothing short of inspirational work. We, we have a network now of almost 40 countries that work together. The website is debatesinternational.org. And that is a place where, as a peer group, we all share ideas about how we can, we can get better, how we can uh, help each other through challenging uh, obstacles, uh, and um, how we make these fulfill their promise as totally unusual opportunities for citizens to hear from the people that want to, to lead them. That is the reason for the title of this talk, is that uh, in the recent Tunisian debates, which were um, absolutely history-making, and this man and his colleagues uh, finally prevailed um, as pioneers, along with many other pioneers in our debate, debate network. And one of the, uh, the media coverage of those debates was, was so touching, and, and one of my favorite quotes was, uh, somebody who was was asked in a in a restaurant or a bar um, where there was a viewing group that had come together well how do, how do you measure this? What does this mean? Because there were imperfections there are always imperfections. We always try to get better each one of us, but that the quote was, "This is a picture of a people learning to choose their own destiny that 's what this is all about that 's pretty powerful so that is a, a snapshot of the commission. 
And um, I think I'm going to get a pop quiz here and then look forward to hearing your, your questions and observations. Thanks so much, uh, Janet. For, yeah, thank you. Um, this, it's, it's really an honor to finally have you here. I was just saying to you, we tried in 2016. It didn't work out, obviously, for very good reasons, because you were quite busy uh, around the fall. Um, and I should also add, we're honored to be part of the international network through my NGO, which recently put on the presidential debates in Tunisia. And Ala, one of the, and Allison uh, were uh, Yale law students who actually came to Tunisia and witnessed the debates. So thank you guys so much for coming. Um, Janet, I want to talk to you uh, about your background very briefly, then about the history of the debates, then about their, uh, the organization kind of what goes into the operation. Uh, their uh, impact on public culture, you know, popular culture, uh, and then finally the international dimension. Let's try and see how far we get. Um, but I do want to know, so the, the CPD was established in 1987. Um, how did you get to work for the CPD? Were you always interested in debate before that? And uh, talk briefly about how you got there. Uh, total accident, just like most things in Washington. Uh, I had uh, been in the government for 15 years after college and graduate school. And uh, we were talking earlier about how improbable it is that the sitting Republican National Committee Chair and Democratic National Committee Chair had come together to start this organization. That is, that is a remarkable thing to think about, especially now. And I was approached and asked if I would, if I would uh, submit my resume to be considered for, for staff director. And ironically, um, when I had been in the government, I was covered by what's known as the Hatch Act, which means you cannot in any way partake of partisan politics. So I had never uh, come close to a campaign or, or political debate. And, uh, and I remember, as I said to some of your colleagues, being asked this and, sounding, and, and saying to my husband that it, it sounded kind of uh, not very appealing on first blush. And he pointed out that I needed a job. And that was definitely the truth. So, uh, so I, I did put in my resume. And I was very, very fortunate to get hired as the first employee. Uh, it, was, uh, it was nothing but luck, and it was a, a very happy bit of luck. And, and Janet, um, let's talk briefly about um, the history of the debate. So famously, Nixon-Kennedy in 1960 is when the first ever uh, televised debates happened. And I was really surprised to, to read recently that it turns out, so Kennedy is widely seen as having won the debate, but it turns out that a lot of people who listened on the radio thought that Nixon won the debate. So I wonder, um, what do you think that tells us about televised debates as a format? Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on what that might mean. Walking over here, we were talking about the fact that, tele that debates uh, at least in their current form, are the ultimate <coughs> visual event. And most people want to see them in real time on TV. If you want to be a purist, in fact, you will forego that and you will just read the transcript or perhaps listen to it on, on radio. But I, it's obvious from the numbers that most people would like to watch this in real time. That means that all of the other impressions that you are going to take in uh, watching a debate are going to be a part of what you process when you figure out uh, who struck you in what way after the debate and during the debate. And that includes everything from the person's appearance, their demeanor, their, the way they treat their opponent, the moderator. Uh, it, it's a very complicated set of signals that, that you have to take in. One of the things I like to say when, I, when I'm teaching classes um, is, to students of political communication, turn the sound off on a debate and watch it for at least 15 minutes if you want to tease out some of the different elements uh, to test what it is that you're taking in. And uh, it, it, there's a very mixed bag of, of factors that anyone brings to a debate. That's going to color where they start and it's going to affect how they feel about what they took in during the debate and afterwards. But it's also a reminder of why we ask people, and this is, there's no getting around this with the media, but we say to people, please don't think of it in terms of who won or who lost a debate. That's actually not a very good way to 
to measure it. Question, did you learn anything during the debate that d you didn't know before? Did it prompt you to think about things in a way that you hadn't thought about that particular topic? That is a whole lot more important to us than who won or who lost, which tends to be more subjective. The numbers for debate audiences are significant, as I mentioned. What's equally interesting is that for years, um, very reliable polling like the Pew Research Centers and exit poll polls that have been run by the networks have shown that people overwhelmingly find the debates helpful. And indeed, uh, exit poll data show for years that people have, they have been one of the top factors in helping people decide how to vote. That's not to say they necessarily change minds. It is to say that people find them helpful. As long as that is the case, I think you can say this is a po positive, productive use of, of 90 minutes. Um, if that ceases to be the case, then I think we should look at a different way of thinking about these. Right. And, and the town hall format, you, you said it uh, started about two cycles ago. Um, I wonder how your own thinking evolved over the years about the formats and how best to serve the mission of the CPD and, and the purpose of the debates and how particularly the town hall format, because it's so different, and I imagine it's, it's a nightmare probably in terms of organization compared to the other debates. So I wonder how that fits into the broader mission and how it helped evolve the, uh, the purpose of the debates. Town hall actually started in 92. Mr. Clinton had been very um, uh, familiar with doing town halls during his, his primary campaign. He really liked them. And uh, so uh, the campaigns asked if one could be town hall. It was at the University of Richmond. And uh, it, was, it was wonderful. Working with the town hall participants is, is fabulous. These are not people who normally are standing with a microphone asking a question of a presidential candidate. They take their jobs very seriously. And um, uh, the public loves them because they identify with a fellow citizen getting up and, and and asking a question. What is increasingly difficult is the recruitment of those citizens. We actually have the Gallup organization recruit the citizens who are from the, the metropolitan area around the university where these are being held. And um, now with such a reduction in landlines and uh, an increasing uh, polarization of, of voters, it is hard to find undecided voters uh, that you can find through standard methodolog methodological survey techniques. So um, the question is, how do you, um, how can you make this move forward in terms of the, the modern feel of it and the spontaneous feel that that first one had um, where it, it isn't managed. It is, it is still fresh and it still allows the citizens to have that interaction with the candidates, which is as you all know, it's very different than when a candidate is asking a professional journalist or answering, rather, a, a question from a professional journalist. Yeah. And so you mentioned, I think, something uh, very interesting, which is, um, uh, and I've been thinking about this a lot as well recently in, in Tunisia, um, one of the criticisms about debates, we have a debate going on tonight, which you have nothing to do with because it's organized by the DNC, but one of the criticisms we often hear is that debates can foment the very kind of conflict that seems to be fueling polarization in, in America and many other countries. Um, and yet it seems to me that, you know, highlighting and uh, uh, highlighting some of the controversial, uh, you know, differences of opinion is actually really, really important. So it seems like there's a, a fine line sometimes between, um, you know, uh, fomenting some of that polarization and adding fuel to the fire, but at the same time, uh, you know, informing voters, which can sometimes, sometimes has to happen through highlighting the very differences that we're so polarized about. So I wonder how you strike that balance in your own thinking. Format is key. And if you can simplify format so that you, um, you have a, an elegant and understandable format that is um, driven by a moderator who will understand that this is about uh, getting the input of, of the candidates, uh, that is about the most important thing that can happen on the stage. Um, you cannot change what a candidate comes on the stage determined to do. 
and you cannot change how individuals are going to relate to each other, um, whether there be two or three in our debates, how they relate um, to the moderator, how they decide to use this event. Um, these are critical in people's political careers. So it, the, no candidate is going to come without thinking about this very carefully. Jim Lehrer has done a um, fascinating series of interviews in an oral history project he's done with us of the former debate participants. And I remember when he did President Carter, President Carter said, if you're on a presidential debate stage and you haven't experienced and studied enough so that you could anticipate 97% of the questions, if not more, then you really haven't been paying attention. This is not something that would just have all of a sudden occurred to you, oh, I guess I better study up. But I do think that the big role for us is to try to keep improving format and to make sure you, you choose a moderator who will take this on with the seriousness of purpose and understanding that their job is to try to remove themselves from the dynamic as much as they can while keeping it on course. Yeah, that's very interesting. And uh, Janet, you've seen so many of these debates. Is there any particular anecdote or kind of behind the scenes memory that you'd like to share that sort of stuck with your mind that um, was maybe funny? How long have you all got? <laughs> there, there are there are endless funny things, um, and and you need humor in the debate business, or you would you you should go do something else. Um, but uh, there there is always something that that you need to anticipate. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the power failure in uh, 1976 when in during one of the Ford Carter debates the power failed. That was when the debates were were being sponsored by the League of Women Voters. And much to the League's horror, there was a power failure. And Mr. Ford and Mr. Carter were on the stage for, think about it, people, 27 minutes of silence uh, while the problem the was most, solved. most awkward 27 quite, minutes in there. <laughs> quite, quite. And that is one of the most interesting pieces of Jim's interviews with the, with the former presidents, is talking with each of those gentlemen about what they did. Um, we have triple redundancy on everything in the debate hall so that you are prepared for, for moments like that. But you still have earpieces that, that fail on the moderators and you still have backup generators that, that fail one third the way d through the debate because they were poorly maintained, which it turns out means you were not flying with a backup system on that. So um, it, is, uh, it is always something that you, you hope you're on your toes and that the whole team has double checked and triple checked so that uh, when you start, you've got a pretty good chance of having everything work the way it should. These are the ultimate um, example of something where you want to make sure that when the debate is over, no one is talking about the sponsor. They are talking about the candidates, the issues, um, the format, whatever, but they're not talking about the sponsor because something hadn't been really paid attention to. Um, I, I do want to go back to um, two things that are often um, put forward by critics of debates. Um, one is fact checking. I know the means of checking facts as the debates happen are, are somewhat limited. And moderators are doing, I think, an increasingly good job at doing it on the spot. But there's only so much you can do if the fact can't be checked immediately. Um, so I wonder what your thoughts are on that and how they've evolved. The second thing is, uh, and this is a broader problem, in uh, political discourse, which is that uh, politicians present promises that are often not kept. Um, and I should very briefly say what we're trying to do about this in Tunisia. We have a program called 99 Days, where uh, we're going to bring back the president on the 30th of January and um, you know, rebroadcast a segment where, in which we asked him in the recent presidential debates to present his priorities for the first 99 days in office, hence the name. Um, we're hoping that we'll increase the cost of these promises uh, because they're made so easily. But uh, I do wonder, you know, what are your general thoughts on fact-checking and uh, electoral promises? The commission's feeling about fact-checking, and which is supported by our um, moderators who make up their own minds on, on this, is uh, it's, it's a practical impossibility in, in live terms during a debate. Um, that there is no way for a moderator to continuously uh, 
check the facts um, while the debate is going on. Um, I personally don't see how it would work in terms of which facts do you check. Where, where does a fact become uh, sufficiently unimportant so that you don't think you should say, well, that, that actually is not right. Uh, some of our moderators believe that the ultimate fact checkers are the candidate's opponent or opponents. Yeah. That's the person that, that should be checking the facts. Um, I, I don't know how you do it in real time during a general election debate and ever keep the debate moving. I think you get stuck on the back and forth and I don't think that serves the public at all. The good news is that never before has it been so easy for any of us to get access to some kind of data where in fact we are checking facts. I realize that that puts the onus on each one of us, but that arguably is where it belongs in terms of our obligations as consumers of this news. And I just, I don't believe there's a way to do it in real time, at least in our debates. I don't think it makes any sense to think that the moderator is here driving the debate and the fact checker is here. And while the fact checker is not speaking, uh, that that person is slipping little pieces of paper to the moderator that say that that number about employment is not current. Uh, I think it just gets incredibly awkward and, and jerky. And then uh, someone is going to come in and say, no, actually, those aren't the numbers you should be using. The better data right. set is, right. is this one. I, I think you get hung up on yeah. that yeah. as fast as you get out of the chute. Yeah. Yeah. And any thoughts on election promises and the broader frustration voters have with promises not kept, which is all too common. You know, I think increasingly, uh, particularly newspapers are trying to do that kind of a disciplined coverage. That's outside the purview of what the commission can do. But uh, but I, I applaud what, what all of you are doing. That's a that's yeah. an elegant thing to build well, into the program. I, th I think that's a great answer, though, because you're sticking with the mission, and it, do it would seem to be off mission. We're, it's, we're broadly yeah. a debate initiative. Yep. I understand you're very focused on the presidential debate, so we that are. makes a lot of sense. But you're right. Like Increasingly, news organizations are actually doing that work, and it's very important. Um, I feel that we could move to the international dimension mm -hmm. so that we leave enough time for the Q&A. Um, so could you talk more generally about the CPD's international work over, um, it's, been, it's been a long time, it's right? Since long the, time. And, you, and you do this together with the National Democratic Institute, and you run this network called Debates International that we're a member of. But talk a little more broadly about what that network does, what the broader philosophy is behind supporting international groups like ours to uh, hold these election debates. This work started anecdotally, one, one on one. It was a unilateral effort between the um, commission and and as you mentioned, the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs, which uh, has field offices all over the world. So there is, there's an enormous symbiosis between what they do and what we can do. And it means that if we go uh, into almost any country, there's a good chance they'll either have a field office or they'll have people that are close who are natives and who know the language and who know the political customs. Uh, it's a very powerful partnership to start with. The, uh, the requests in the beginning uh, were basically from, from countries that said, we, are, we would like to think about debates. Uh, we don't know where to start. We're not sure how to identify a good sponsor. We don't know how to get the candidates to agree. We don't know how to get these covered in a way that reaches everybody in the country that wants to see it. Uh, we don't know how to pick a moderator or to train that, that person. And in many countries, as you can well imagine, where there's state-owned media, there's already suspicion that you won't, in fact, get neutral coverage. So we started by, by just giving this advice one-off. And over time, it became clear there was critical mass. And so um, I think it was uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago now, we started having uh, symposia where we would bring all of the members of the network together, uh, usually in Washington, but now Every four years, they come to a debate site. And we have the symposium there. And that means they get to actually see how the debate is, is being produced and put together. Uh, and it is, as I said, it is nothing short of inspiring. In many cases, the, the work that these partners are doing is very dangerous. Uh, it is not supported or smiled upon by incumbent office holders or parties. 
uh, and they are operating with something that, without something that we have, which is, I would argue, the most important asset, and that is most of those places do not have public expectation that debates will come about. Uh, at the end of the day, that is the single most powerful lever to make debates happen, is the public saying, we want to see these people. Uh, in at least half of our cycles, there has been pushback from one or, or more candidates. Other countries, I think, look at us and say, well, this never happens in the United States. It does happen. Uh, it happens everywhere. Uh, and the single thing that is the most powerful influence on candidates is the public saying, but we have now heard from all of our uh, debate, excuse me, uh, general election leading candidates, including incumbents, going back to 1976. And it literally comes down to something as, as fundamental as, what are you doing that is more important? Why can you not find 90 minutes on these three nights, which are known a year ahead of time, to come and be part of this conversation. There is deep suspicion that this is not okay. You, you should come and, and be a part of this. And that means that when we work with these different countries, and it's a peer network, we all learn from each other. Uh, one of the big obstacles is to say, how do you tell your citizens this is something that they have the right to see and that they should make clear they want to see. And that is the way you will get over this very, very important initial threshold. Beyond that, there are all of these other, as you know well, big obstacles. And one of them, to go back to what I said about the White House pool, is in many countries there is no tradition of having um, competitive media agree to show something uh, to, to all of their audiences across their platforms. And that's a game changer. In some of these countries, they have to pay for the airtime. That's expensive. Uh, so it's, it's been absolutely extraordinary. And of course, what's happened is, as, as we are proof, we've all become good friends. And uh, we work together on not only the debates, but on, on other issues. One of the most inspiring things is when I get one of these email chains when one of the member countries is in the way of, of a natural disaster. And particularly in the Caribbean, it is absolutely amazing to see all these little members of the international network popping up and going, we're OK. We've got power. Next one on the list, let us know when you're OK. If not, what do you need? And it's not like they have a great deal to, to share. So these bonds have become very strong. No, that's super interesting, and and um, you 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 made me remember a question I've been, always wanted to ask. Actually, um, at the moment, there is nothing that prevents in the United States a candidate from, except public opinion and the cost that that would be to their campaign. There's nothing that prevents you from saying you don't want to do a debate. Is that correct? Correct. There's no law that says you must debate. Uh, regardless of whether you take public funding or anything else. Okay, so it's just the cost to, to your campaign and, and what people think. Because I, uh, I did hear recently from Matt, especially Matt DePel runs on a day-to-day -day basis the International Debates Network. And um, Argentina is an interesting case because there mm -hmm. um, the uh, electoral debates are essentially mandated by law mm -hmm. and you lose mm -hmm. access to public funds for, uh, for your campaign if you choose not to participate. Uh, in a debate, and I guess it also raises a, another question, and perhaps you could comment on both. You know, there's always some margin to negotiate with campaigns about some details of the debates, uh, and at the same time, you, you don't want the campaigns to dictate uh, in an unreasonable way the, the shape or the, the timing or whatever it may be of the debate. So I wonder where you draw that line and how you feel about the, the case of Argentina, which uh, I think South Korea is doing the same now. Um, uh, if you could comment on that, I think it would be very interesting. We determine the places, the dates, the length of time, the moderators, the format of the debates. Um, it's the opinion of my board of directors that if something affects the educational value of the debates, that is non-negotiable. If something affects the set or 
um, another aspect that a candidate or both feel strongly about uh, if there is one or two or three people on the stage, whether there is a strong inclination to want to stand as opposed to sit. We, we believe sitting with the moderator offers a very much better chance for a really good conversation. Uh, if there is some kind of strong feeling about that, it makes every bit of sense to negotiate those things so that, in fact, you don't get stuck on yeah. one of those. It's also extremely important that when you turn on a debate, uh, each candidate is equally respected in terms of what you are seeing. Um, if you think about the range of different candidates, their age, their stature, their coloring, uh, it is it's a, an enormous tribute to the skills of our lighting designer, our set designers, that um, no one ever has come to us and said, we thought that our candidate, in fact, got the short end of the stick in terms of appearing in a way that was complimentary, respectful, dignified. The set needs to be constructed the exact same way. There will be discrepancies in height. There will be things like uh, Senator Dole's um, inability to use both arms with the same level of fluidity. Uh, you, you must be respectful to that. It would be completely wrong to say, this is the plan and you, you have no say. Uh, so we try to, to, uh, to negotiate those things in a way that is respectful and, and serious. And I'm happy to say, I think, for the most part, that's exactly the way they've been resolved. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I think one final question, which is uh, somewhat complex, but um, so um, if the, the last few decades are any indication, um, and this is a prediction, I think what we might see, uh, particularly in the Arab world in the next 10 years or so, is um, similar to how elections for authoritarian regimes at some point became a way to legitimize their power, then election observation missions, especially the lenient ones, uh, that started popping up in the region, facade election observation missions, one should call them, started uh, becoming uh, a fashion So, that in order to sort of legitimize these elections. My prediction in, in the 20s will increasingly see sort of facade election uh, debates. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, I've just come from a country in the Arab world. I was there last week where the election authority invited me and I uh, formed that thought as I left the meeting, that that's, that's where we're headed. So my question is, um, is, is, there, is a, any debate a good debate and worth of support, or where should one draw the line? Um, and I realize this is complex, but I'm asking you out of uh, self-interest because I'm, I'm not sure mm -hmm. where to draw that line at mm -hmm. this point. But it's, it's very clear that not every country's debate project is necessarily a good project because uh, this trend might become a reality in the coming years. So. I wonder if you have any thoughts to share about that. No, that's a very, that's a very good point. Uh, and indeed, we do get contacted by some groups that say they want to put on a debate in a certain country. And obviously, the first thing you do is to do a lot of research and talk extensively with that group and find out, um, are, do they actually have credibility as a debate sponsor? Um, is, what is their objective? Is it, in fact, to do something that is good for the, um, the democratic efforts that are going on in that country, or is it actually serving their own agenda more? And uh, particularly ones where you discover that the relationship between the group and the country are a bit tenuous, uh, we, we have very scarce resources. And uh, uh, you obviously don't want to spend even time, not to mention time and money, because one of the things, as you know well, is that, that we do where it's, where it's possible and where it would be helpful is to send a, a SWAT team to uh, the country that is putting on debates so that we can actually have some of our production people on the ground to help with this. It would, it would not be a good use of those resources if you discover this group just does not, even if they are, completely sincere in their purposes. They, they have no chance of actually breaking in and being seen as a legitimate debate sponsor. You need to try to figure out, is that, is that a good way to, to try to help? Um, but you also want to be completely respectful of 
the circumstances in a country which we can't possibly know as well as people who are in that process. It raises another thing, which is very important to mention, as you know intimately. We never go to, to any other country, any NGO, and say, your debate should look like ours. That would be all wrong. There may be pieces of our debates that, that they find helpful and appropriate, and uh, there may be a lot that they don't. And it would be completely wrong to go in and say, you should do what we do. Well, you've certainly set a standard because uh, CNN described our debates as U.S.-style debates, and I never saw them that way, but I think that's just uh, uh, a fact that you've been doing this for the longest, so um, uh, it's certainly an example that can't be ignored by other debate sponsors. Um, Janet, thank you so much. This was really, really interesting. I'm done with my part of the questions.